welcome to the nurse station. My name is Maria Mobley and today we are going to learn about chest tubes. So as always, these videos are for educational purposes only, but I really hope they're helping you future nurses. So something you all need to understand about chest tubes is I've noticed with my students over time that it's an assumption that we are only caring for high acuity patients with chest tubes, meaning maybe in critical care or your step down units. But in actuality, you can take care of a client with a chest tube on any unit, ranging from medical surgical um, all the way up to critical care. So this is a skill that you will need to understand. Um, we'll talk about critical thinking with chest tubes. And let's just start with basic respiratory function. All right, so we get our, our um, heads wrapped around how do chest tubes work. And also, I'm going to always, always gear you towards answering NCLEX style questions, okay? So, let's think about how we breathe. When we inspire, right, take a breath in, your diaphragm actually drops down. So, we breathe via negative pressure, meaning we take a breath in, our diaphragm drops down, and we have more space in our thoracic cavity. And it kind of creates a vacuum, and we suck air in. We're sucking our oxygen in to fill that extra space and then our pressure gets too much and via exhalation we blow out again. Okay? So that is called breathing via negative pressure and a very simple way to understand it. So again, think. Take a breath in. Diaphragm drops down. More space is created. It acts like a vacuum. Sucks in air. That's called via negative pressure and then when we exhale because the pressure gets too much, we exhale to release, for instance, carbon dioxide, okay? So we breathe via negative pressure. The whole purpose of a chest tube is to maintain negative pressure in our lungs. So I really kind of want y'all, if you don't mind, to take notes during this lecture because I did not have near enough room on the board to really go into the details that you need to understand to care for chest tubes and also to act quickly for your clients. So, if you think about your indications, we have a pleural space in our lungs. And I'll just draw a quick, quick picture. I don't really have room, but let's go down here. Picture this is a lung. And we have a visceral and parietal pleura. And inside our lung is this little space. It's called the pleural space. And that space, when we breathe in and out, uh, gently glides against each other. There's fluid in that space to prevent friction. And that helps allow this whole negative pressure concept to be achieved. It allows our lungs to increase in pressure when we inhale to allow that sucking of air inside to our lungs. And then also when our diaphragm pops back up in exhalation, it allows us to breathe out. So we want to maintain this pressure, but things can happen. I didn't list your indications up here, but let's say trauma to the chest. Let's say fluid or air start to build up in that space. Well, now it is compromising the whole system. It is not allowing negative pressure to be maintained. So examples of why we need chest tubes, pneumothorax, a collapsed lung, hemothorax, we have blood, for instance, from trauma that's built up in our lungs. But we just need to think that we are draining excess air or excess fluid for one reason or another. Because if we don't drain it from this space, we won't be able to breathe effectively. Negative pressure will not be able to be maintained. So that is the basic understanding of why we need a chest tube, to maintain negative pressure, all right? So we have two common chest tube devices that we use. One is a wet, um, and typically you see an atrium as the device, that's what we call it, this chamber, this collection device chamber, we typically call it atrium but we have a wet device and a dry device, all right? And I listed universal implications regardless if you're using a wet or dry suction control chamber, okay? Universal things that we need to understand about chest tubes. And then under each device, I've actually listed a difference that you need to keep in mind depending on the type of device you're using to maintain and reestablish negative pressure in your client so they can breathe effectively, okay? So, in, these, in this NCLEX style question, something I need you to understand. In terms of prioritization, if you see what do you do first, what is most important, what is priority, I am 
going to talk about things you need to look for, but if you ever have a concern that something could be wrong, your first priority is to go to your client. This is a device. This is a, this is a tool. It's kind of like um, showing us potential problems. It's allowing for drainage of excess fluid and air. But if you have a problem, your priority is to go to your client because you need to ensure respiratory functioning. If you see anything that might be showing you a problem, you need to inspect your client and ensure that the chest is rising and falling. Because remember, the purpose is to maintain negative pressure and negative pressure is what allows us to inhale and exhale. So you need to make sure, you need to inspect chest rise and fall. You need to auscultate breath sounds. You need to ensure that air is moving. So if there is ever a concern in your NCLEX style question, I want you to go. I want you to go and assess your client, all right? So now we're gonna start talking about nursing interventions, what we have to do to maintain these systems, and then what also could show signs of problems that may have developed. So step one, all right, this is your chest tube device, just so y'all remember and understand, your respiratory system is sterile. So when these chest tubes are placed by, uh, let's say the healthcare provider, it is done sterilely. Anytime you are to change a dressing around a chest tube site, or we're gonna talk about what happens if the chest tube becomes dislodged, we want to be placing sterile uh, dressings on top of these insertion sites, okay? So this is inserted sterilely. And let's talk about our chest tube devices in general. Regardless if you use a wet suction or dry suction chest tube, they each have three chambers that you need to understand. The first one is the collection chamber. Do you see it on both sides? This tubing is our chest tube, which goes directly into our client's lungs. And this tubing drains whatever is in the client's lungs that we need to get out. So for instance, blood, it's a hemothorax. This tubing is draining the blood into our collection device, all right? This water seal chamber in the middle, this water seal chamber acts like, I want you to think about a one-way valve. So let's think about this. In order to maintain negative pressure, don't we need a closed system, right? Don't we want excess fluid and air to get out of our pleural space, but we don't want anything to get back in. If you have air getting back into your lungs, you can cause another problem, and I don't mean you, I just mean the device. Uh, we could cause another problem, for instance, such as a tension pneumothorax, where there's too much pressure in the lung and our lungs collapse. So this water seal acts like a one-way valve. We always, with a chest tube, the primary concept is to establish that negative pressure, but to allow things that we don't want in the chest to get out, but we don't want anything to get back in, such as air, because can't air easily move in and out because they always, you know, because of our pressure. So this is gonna act like a one-way valve. It will allow everything to drain out, but it will not allow things to go back up this tube back into our lungs, all right? And the last thing is your suction control chamber. So with a wet seal, we put fluid into this suction control chamber. And depending on the level of our water in this column, it can have increased suction or decreased suction, okay? So think of this as your suction, all right? Um, same with this. This is a dry uh, suction control chamber. And pretty much this is hooked up to the R wall suction and we are ensuring that it is, um, be, it is to suction because this little bellow, it looks like a little orange accordion will stick out and we want it inflated. And we set our suction to our physicians or healthcare providers orders. Because remember, we want to maintain suction. We again can increase the level of suction by the fluid that we put in our wet, our wet suction control chamber. Because we either need to pull more forcibly uh, air and fluid out, or maybe it's at a lower level to pull less forcibly air and fluid out. But we want to maintain control suction so we can again get contents out of our lungs that we don't want there but this water seal can chamber is gonna pre prevent things from going back up, okay? All right, so those are your three basic chambers, and now I'm gonna walk you through what you need to think about with each chamber, all right? So, step one is to ensure tubing is secure and free of kinks. So, these chest tubes, remember, this is what is going directly into our client. 
Uh, there's an insertion site, and these, this tube can be very long. Clients can walk with their chest tube atriums. Um, they can be mobile, they can move around. So there is a lot of tubing that can be associated with these um, collection devices. So we need to ensure that our tubing, let's think if a bed wheel was laying on this tubing right here. Think about the amount of pressure. It wouldn't allow our fluid and our air to escape from our chest. It will stop and then pressure would increase. If our tubing was kinked, um, and I'm, again, I'm giving you the example of a bed wheel being over that tubing, it could again cause a complication such as a tension pneumothorax. All that pressure could go back into our lungs and collapse it, okay? Um, let's say this is connected right here. And when you take care of chest tubes and when you're looking at your collection devices and your tubing, you're going to see a lot of taping around everything, all right? We have to ensure that everything is secured. We need to maintain a closed system. Let's say uh, this was connected here and it was loose. What would enter potentially into our lungs? Fluid could enter into our lungs. It could uh, come in and go into a place that we don't want it to go. I said, I said fluid. Air can come in from the outside environment into our lungs. Let's think about this as well. If there's not a secure tape connection, if it is not a closed system, we could also have an air leak. We could have um, fluid and air escaping and the suction might not be pulling appropriately because that system is not maintaining a closed system. So with your tubing, please ensure that there's no kinks on it, that they're not sitting on their tubing, that um, a bed wheel isn't rolled over the tubing, that um, nothing is obstructing air and fluid from coming out of that chest or creating increase in pressure, okay? And let please also ensure that everything is securely taped, everything is securely connected, so we are maintaining a closed system which allows for the drainage, the appropriate drainage of fluid and air via suction, okay? So ensure that your tubing is secure and free of kinks. Ensure that the drainage system is always below the level of the chest. How can it, think about it, it's kind of just like a Foley catheter. We want fluid to drain by gravity, or we want gravity to assist us in the drainage, right? If you took that collection chamber above the chest, could fluid and air flow back into the chest, which is what we absolutely don't want, okay? Because it can, again, increase the pressure in our chest, potentially causing a tension pneumothorax. So always ensure that the uh, collection um, chamber is below the level of the chest, all right? Always assess your drainage and report output. So you will need to look at your drainage. We need to be measuring the amount, and it's dependent on your unit, how often you assess output. Um, you know, some units can do Q hour. If it's a trauma client, high acuity patient. Some units can do Q shift. And we don't just change these systems out. There is multiple collection device chambers that I did not put on here for lack of room. But if the whole device gets full, yes, we would have to change the atrium system out. But let's say my shift, I only got 30 mLs of output. I would actually mark on my system, well, this is at 35. I would mark on my system, put my initials, MM, and the date and time that I took it. So the next shift, let's say the drainage gets up to here, they would mark here and know that, let's say, only 50 came out for their shift. So we continuously mark on our um, collection chamber our output for our shifts. So when you want to look at the color, um, these systems have the ability to drain infections from the lung. So you might notice purulent drainage. If it's hemothorax, you'd see blood. So you want to note the color, of course, like you would any drainage from any tube. But we really also need to be looking at the amount. If you have 100 mLs out within an hour, we are concerned. We This client is... Um, could be bleeding excessively, could have uh, trauma that we didn't identify uh, with the initial x-ray or something like that. So please report any output that is greater than 100 mLs per hour. Always assess your drainage. Always mark um, your drainage and calculate it according to your facility's policies. And then we're going to talk about our other two chambers now. So you're going to hear in these NCLEX style questions something called titling. Titling happens in the water seal chamber, and this is again universal for both devices. It doesn't matter if it's wet or dry. Titling is showing a change in pressure. 
So isn't it true we just talked about how we breathe? When we inhale, don't we have increased pressure in our lungs? And exhale um, because we're trying to get, get that excess pressure out, right? So you will see tiling in your water seal chambers. It'll look like this little um, bead, almost, that when we inhale, you should see the bead go up, and when we exhale, it should go down. Tidaline is normal. When You should see tidaline with inhalation and exhalation. It's just showing there's a change in pressure. So tidaline is absolutely normal in a water seal control chamber. However, I do also want you to know if the lung has fully re-expanded, you can see titling stop, okay? So, titling is normal, or if it's fully re-expanded, it could stop. Also, you could see titling stop if we have a problem with our pressure. So, um, let's say something is obstructing the chest tube. Let's say that bed wheel is on top of our chest tube again. We might see titling not occurring. So, the fact is, Tidaline is normal in our um, water seal control chamber. I, I said control chamber. In our water seal chamber, okay? It's normal. But if it stops, it could either mean a good or a bad thing. It could either mean our lung is fully re-expanded, or it can mean, again, that maybe our tubing is obstructed for one reason or another. So it's not showing the change of pressure in our chest. So, Critically thinking, if you see titling stop, what should you do? You should go assess your client because you can't prove with just that assessment data alone if the lung has fully re-expanded or we have a problem that we have to address, okay? So that's what titling is. You should see titling. Again, it's this little, almost looks like a bead going up and down. So up with inhalation, down with exhalation. Uh, if they're on a mechanical ventilator, you will actually see it reverse. Just because mechanical ventilators, you will learn when you get there. Uh, we are breathing our clients via po positive pressure. But again, tidaline is normal in the water seal chamber. But if it stops, go assess your client. Because it can, either can mean the lung is fully re-expanded or we have a problem. Okay? And now let's talk about bubbling in the water seal chamber. If we have bubbling in the water seal chamber, this could mean an air leak. And again, what an air leak is, if we are not maintaining a closed system, are we maintaining appropriate suction? Are we getting that fluid and air or whatever we need to get out of the lungs, are we getting it out appropriately if suction is not being maintained, if a closed system is not being maintained? So if you ever see continuous bubbling in a water seal chamber, you need to start to assess. You need to ensure that your client's respiratory function is okay. Are they breathing? What is their pulse ox? Can you auscultate breath sounds? But on these devices, you can even note the degree of the level of air leak um, because we have very minor air leaks to excessive, severe air leaks. And this is a little advanced. Uh, your teacher may or may not talk about this. We can determine where the air leak can be it can be at the insertion site. It could be a problem with the chest tube into our thoracic cavity. Or we can have an air leak. Maybe this wasn't taped appropriately. Maybe air is escaping through our connections between our tubing. Because remember, you're going to see that this tubing can be very long. You can have multiple sites of tubing connected together and they're always taped um, very securely together. And remember, the chest tube and the tubing go straight into this collection chamber that allows that drainage of blood or air and it needs to be taped securely at the site. So this might, again, your teacher may or may not talk about this, but I'll quickly tell you how we assess where the air leak is. Let's think about this. If I were to clamp, and something else you need to remember with clamping, NCLEX style questions do not like clamping. And it makes sense. If we clap, clamp chest tube, the chest tube or the chest tube tubing for too long, can't pressure build up and go into our lungs and collapse it via a tension pneumothorax. Too much pressure in our lungs because we've clamped the tubing, we've obstructed the tubing. You will see in clinical practice, we do have to clamp tubing for certain things. One of the, one of the things is to determine where our air leak is. Another, for instance, if this, this atrium, all these collection uh, chambers get full with blood, we have to clamp very quickly 
way to change a new, a new whole atrium device in and out. So there are very few times when we clamp. I've noticed in NCLEX style questions, clamping never is the answer because of that risk of tension pneumothorax. But this is just to allow you to understand how we assess leaks better. If I were to clamp right here, right at the insertion site, and I continue to see bubbling, most likely the source of the air leak is with this device or with the tubing below the site. Because I've clamped right here, we shouldn't have an air leak. I've, I've uh, held pressure, so nothing should be escaping. But if you still see bubbling, it's most likely an air leak in that tubing distal to the site or the actual collection device itself. If we clamp here and the bubbling stops, most likely the air leak problem could actually be, for instance, around the insertion site. There might be too much air escaping around the actual chest tube itself. And we can apply a petroleum gauze, a Vaseline gauze, or a sterile occlusive dressing to try to stop the air from escaping. So that's a little bit more advanced in detail. I just did want to let you know how we assess for air leaks. But continuous bubbling in your water seal chamber is not okay. We need to start, always go to your client first, that's step one in prioritization for the NCLEX Perfect World, but then we need to start trying to find the source of our air leak. Whether it's you need to secure your tubing better, you need to make sure it's tight and secured, or uh, we might need to put more dressings, more occlusive dressings around our chest tube insertion site if this is the problem, okay? And now, um, it talks about assessing of the chest tube insertion site. This is physically going into the client's chest wall. Just like any other incision, you need to assess for infection. You need to assess for drainage. Um, you need to palpate around the site. There's something called subcutaneous emphysema. It kind of feels like Rice Krispies. Subcutaneous emphysema can occur with chest tubes. It means air has escaped into our subcutaneous tissue. And again, it feels like Rice Krispies. Majority of the time, if they're smaller in nature, typically they resolve on their own, okay? We, what we would do is just mark, let's say this is my chest tube site. Let's say I palpated, uh, you know, an inch around my chest tube, subcutaneous emphysema. I would actually mark on the client's skin where I feel the emphysema, okay? Again, it feels like rice, I, the best way I can describe it is it feels like Rice Krispies. And then that way the next nurse if they start to feel, and maybe they're palpating much further out of that area, it's starting to grow. So that's a way we can keep an eye on it. And really, if it starts to dramatically expand, we've notified the healthcare provider um, so that they can start figuring the best care plan for this client, the best plan of care for this client. And then we have unplanned removal, all right? Chest tubes are sutured in. And remember, um, clients can accidentally pull it out. Um, clients can be active and ambulating with these types of tubes. So unplanned removal of these tubes can occur. And it's your responsibility as their nurse to be able to act quickly. So two places that it can occur. The chest tube can actually physically become dislodged from the client's chest wall, all right? And let's think about it. If the tube falls out, now we have a hole. Can air and products from the environment get in that we don't want it to? Because anytime we have stuff coming into the chest, that can always cause too much pressure inside the chest, leading potentially leading to a collapsed lung, right? So if you ever see a chest tube come out of a chest, at the bedside, you should always have a Vaseline gauze or petroleum gauze, right? So you would very quickly and as sterilely as possible slap that gauze onto that site because Vaseline gauze is semi-permeable, meaning it kind of acts like a one-way valve. It still will let fluid and air come or drain to the outside environment, but it won't allow anything to get back in the chest. So it's very, it's acting very similar to your water seal, okay? I have also seen a lot of NCLEX style questions stating that you need to apply a sterile occlusive dressing taped on three sides. And again, the, excuse me, the concept is acting like that one-way valve. 
So a, put a sterile occlusive dressing taped on three sides. It is a, still allowing stuff to come out, but it's preventing things to come in from the outside environment, such as air, okay? So again, if the chest tube comes dislodged from the chest wall, place a, a petroleum gauze, Vaseline gauze over the site, or that sterile occlusive dressing taped on three sides. That's what I've seen a lot of NCLEX resources using lately, okay? The other things that can occur, the chest tube tubing can actually come dislodge from this collection device chamber, the entire entity itself. Um, so let's think about it. If it becomes dislodged, now we have nothing to prevent air from going inside the tube and we are risking that our lungs will collapse, okay? So I have seen time and time again in, NCLEX, uh, in the NCLEX perfect world, if this ever becomes dislodged, you are to submerge your chest tubing into a bottle of sterile water whatever you have avail available. And if you submerge it into the water, it is acting like a wet seal. It's acting like, um, uh, it's just acting like a wet collection device chamber. It is trying to reestablish that negative pressure, okay? So that is the most typical thing I have seen done in the NCLEX perfect world. In the real world, um, we would get an atrium device as quickly as possible while obstructing the end of the chest tube and then re reattaching it to our collection device chamber. But again, I, have, I take a lot of NCLEX style questions and I don't ever see that answer because I've noticed NCLEX style questions do not like clamping of any type because of the risk when we clamp our chest tubes, that pressure could build up in our lungs, again, uh, creating a risk for attention pneumothorax and making our lungs collapse. So. If it becomes dislodged from the collection device chamber, the whole entity itself, you are to submerge it in sterile water as quickly as possible to, re to try to reestablish that negative pressure. So the one difference between these two uh, devices is related to the suction control chamber. Again, with your wet uh, collection device chambers, your suction is maintained by a column of water that is higher or lower, depending on the amount of suction that you want. But it is normal, very normal, for bubbling to occur in the suction control chamber if it's connected to suction. Doesn't that make sense? It's water, you got it connected to suction, you can see bubbling. So please, please, please do not confuse bubbling in your suction control chamber for a wet device versus bubbling in your water seal. Because continuous bubbling in your water seal is indicating you have an air leak, which is a problem. Continuous bubbling in your suction control chamber for a wet device is not a problem. That is normal. So make sure you know the difference between your chambers. On the opposite end, with your dry suction, you don't have any water or a water column uh, that is controlling suction based upon the level of water in that column. You have a bellow. And when it is hooked to suction, this bellow always, it looks like a little orange accordion, needs to be out. It needs to show that it is popped out, not flat, because that's showing that you have suction. And again, this little dial, you dial up to the level of suction that the healthcare provider orders um, to ensure that the correct amount of suction is maintained for our client. So I really hope this helped. I try to keep it very basic. Um, because chest tubes can be very scary for a new nurse, but do know it is never, ever a dumb question when you are taking care of people's lives. So if you have any concern, you will be trained, you know, whoever's with you, your preceptor, or whoever's mentoring you when you start as a new nurse, how to deal with chest tubes. You need to make sure that you, you're noting the amount of drainage, and we don't want 100, it to exceed 100 mLs per hour. We need to ensure and always look for continuous bubbling in our water seal chambers because that can show an air leak. I don't know if I've mentioned, I've been rambling forever, sorry, this is pretty, pretty detailed. If you do have intermittent bubbling in your water seal chamber, that can occur when you see changes of pressure such as like coughing or sneezing, that's okay, but it should not be continuous, all right? If it's continuous, we need to start looking, always step one, go to your client, make sure that they're breathing, make sure that they're exchanging gas and 
um, your auscultating breath sounds, but then we need to start looking for an air leak. Remember, tidaline is absolutely normal in our water seal chambers, but if tidaline stops, it could be a good thing or a bad thing. So step one, you can't prove it with just that assessment data alone. You go to your client and make sure they're breathing, okay? Um, so tidaline is normal, but if it stops, please assess your client to see if possibly the lung is re-expanded or we have another problem, okay? And last, just note the differences on your suction control chambers. If this is such a suction for your wet, um, you will see bubbling. Uh, for your dry, you need to make sure that the bellow is out, make sure that the suction is at the appropriate level that the healthcare provider has ordered. And then again, just knowing to look for any complications. If your client has a chest tube and their baseline did not show respiratory dis distress, right? Let's say all of a sudden they have labored breathing. Let's say their pulse ox is going down. You need to act quickly. Let's say that um, all of a sudden you have 200 mLs of output in an hour. That is not okay. You need to act quickly. So really look for certain complications. And attention pneumothorax is always something that we're going to look for. Because anytime we have something going into our lungs, there's a risk that pressure will enter into our lungs as well, such as um, the, the tubing being kinked or a bed being over the tubing or the client sitting on their tubing. We need to look for those signs of attention pneumothorax. You should never start to see uh, a, tracheal start, a tracheal start to deviate. Uh, if they start again getting labored in breath, if their pulse ox starts to go low, it could lead to other complications such as attention pneumothorax. So please be assessing your client frequently. Anytime you see any concern on your collection devices uh, as a whole, you need to make sure to go to your client and that ensure that their respiratory status is okay. All right? So I have one NCLEX style question for you um, that I wanna do. And I want you to put this on pause. I want you to read it and pick your answer. So, when you read this question, you should have underlined your topic. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with a hemothorax. And upon assessment, the nurse inspects no titling in the water seal chamber. So, don't even look at your answer choices. No titling, what does that mean? That can either mean we have a problem or that the lung has fully re-expanded. So, because you can't prove what it is, you need to gather more data. Remember, we can only intervene or jump to that step in our nursing process if our assessment and the stem of our question is showing us a right here, right now problem. We can't prove we have a right here, right now problem. So we need to assess, all right? So this is the intervention. This is assessment, this is the intervention, this is assessment. Get rid of your interventions. If you're not understanding how I'm breaking down this NCLEX style question, watch my NCLEX question breakdown video uh, because you can always pick apart NCLEX style questions, those prioritization questions, because remember, this key word now makes it a priority question. So if we can assess one thing and one thing only with a client that is either showing that their lung is fully re-expanded or that now they maybe they have a collapsed lung or we have another problem going, what would you do? Would you go to the device or would you go to your patient? And we should always, always go to our patient. So we should ensure that their respiratory status is functioning, all right? So I really hope this helps you. Again, chest tubes can be overwhelming, but keep it basic, keep it simple. Know what each chamber means, know what you have to look for um, or know what to look for to, if it's showing you a complication. Know what's normal in each chamber. Know about your basic care if the chest tube is going to come out of the chest wall or from the entire collection device itself, okay? So that's kind of a quick, really quick, basic introduction to chest tubes. And again, once you are a nurse caring for these clients, you will know how to act. You will keep your clients safe and always, always ask questions. Take care.